Hey everybody, this is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is, we're getting closer to September, which means back to school. With me is special guest, uh, Brina Moritz, who is the superintendent of Pine Valley Central School. I've known Brina for quite some time <laughs> and happy to work with her. Uh, Brina, let's just dig in. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. What's your favorite cup of coffee? Do you have a cup of coffee, a blend? Anything? Oh, Starbucks medium roast black. Wow. So specific, you're, <laughs> you're ready to order. <laughs> awesome. Um, so tell me, one of the questions I ask pretty much all of my guests is tell me about your educational journey from student to teacher, principal. Okay. Thank you, first of all, for having me, Mr. Wheelock. I started my educational career at Pine Valley as a kindergarten student. I attended Pine Valley until second grade. I'm very happy to be back, by the way. Then I transferred to St. Joe's Catholic School in Gowanda for third and fourth grade, returned to the Valley for fifth through eighth grade, and then finished my high school career at Gowanda Central School. After Gowanda, I went on to Gannon University as a honors pre-law student. I attended that program and very quickly realized I was simultaneously working for a law office. And I realized that the law was interesting, but not for me. I didn't enjoy it the way I had enjoyed uh, coaching, cheerleading, teaching karate, working with kids. And it wasn't, it wasn't my passion. So I came home one break, spoke to my mom and said, I think I want to be a teacher. She looked at me and said, well, we kind of all knew that all along. You really should have done that from the beginning. And I made a change that semester to SUNY Fredonia, where I got my undergraduate degree in childhood education. I then got my, I got my first teaching job. I worked as a teacher's aide at Gwanda for a little while, and then got my teaching job at Sherman as a fourth grade teacher. From there, I moved to be a fifth and sixth grade ELA teacher. From there, I moved to be the chief information officer, CSE chair, grant writer, and curriculum coordinator for the district. And after that, I became their pre-K through 12 principal. And from there, I saw the opening for Pine Valley and wanted to return and give something back to a community who built the foundation of who I am and gave me so much. Um, so I returned to Pine Valley as the superintendent, and I'm very blessed to be here. In the interim, I did get my, I skipped this part, I got my admin degree at St. Bonaventure. And before I became the CSE chair, I got a master's in special ed. So. That's a really broad background. Does it feel, do you get a kind of special feeling being back here at Pine Valley to have been a student and then come back? I mean, do you often kind of pinch yourself sometimes to think yeah, how that happened? I love being here and I love being able to help take care of and support people like our cook manager who I've known since I was five years old and see students that are the kids of kids I went to school with and to know that we, we all grew up in a very similar fashion and that I'm here with a mission to make things better for our kids. I really believe in the power of education and I believe in having small class sizes and taking care of our own. And I think a system like Pine Valley is the perfect place to do that. So I love being here with people that I truly have known since I was a child and care about. So you started two years before our infamous um, pandemic, how did you manage through the pandemic and what were your key things you wanted to focus on? Um, successes, hurdles? So I would say I, I got here and I had a few months before we were officially shutting the place down, which is no one's dream to become the superintendent, start the work. We started a reading program. We really hit the ground running. And then we ended up with a mandate to pretty much close school for a few months because of the pandemic. And that wasn't ideal. But what we stuck with the whole time was I knew that we needed to build some relationships at Pine Valley. So I wanted to keep that work going. I knew that we had some goals to improve student achievement. So we tried our hardest to keep that work going. But I would say my number one concern was trying to be very aware of our 
customer service base. Our families are our customers. We need to take care of them. And our staff is our, our in-house family. So I wanted to take care of our staff as well. So that was our number one goal here is to, I said it over and over again, take care of our families, take care of our students, take care of our team. And we really tried to do that. I think that taking care of everyone is very multifaceted. One of the concerns I had was, you know, if my son gets COVID, I'm very reflective on the fact that I am lucky and have a job that I can take sick time and still be paid when I have to be home to quarantine for him. That's not true for our whole community. So if we aren't safe and we're not careful through this pandemic, that ends up with people in our community missing two weeks of wages to watch their children. So I would say that was a priority. One of the pieces we had to think about, how do we do this in a really safe way while still being in person? Because part of that taking care of our families is we need to provide them with somewhere for our kids to go so they can go to work. So, and we want our kids to be educated and provide them those meals and a warm place to be and make sure that they have a, have a nice, supportive environment around them when everything else in the world is a little bit darker in a pandemic. So I I think that our take care of everyone mentality really came through. And we just, we tried to do that the best we could with a team approach and open ears to listen to needs and concerns. Do you think maybe a, a secret to success was able to have students in the building, buildings? I wouldn't even say it was a secret to success. It was the (laughs) only way to success. We realized pretty quickly that unlike other districts, there were concerns for neighboring districts. And I'm not saying we were the only district that was like this, but our concern wasn't getting people MiFi's and getting them devices to provide internet. We already had a plan to do that. Our concern was when we started the pandemic, we couldn't find something that would actually reach some of the more remote geographical areas in our district. So we had a lot of homes that even if we fully provided internet at that time, we knew we couldn't reach them. Different cell phones wouldn't work, the Wi-Fi wouldn't work. So because of that, we had to go mainly paper-based, a lot of phone calls. And if a family was fortunate enough to have a location where they had decent Wi-Fi, it didn't always mean we could live stream. So that made it so that that connection with teachers was really not there. So unless we were in person, we weren't going to get that live instruction. So that's the only way we really could survive this was trying to be in person. Do you feel with your lessons learned as a, as a school that you're prepared and I think nimble now to make adjustments should the need arise? I think we're prepared to make adjustments. I think we are, we have a much more solid infrastructure. We did apply for a grant and they helped by providing our families with MiFi devices and working through different technical difficulties with our tech team to make sure that more of our families have Wi-Fi. I would say though, my personal feeling is that we're more prepared, but if we have to make a shift, it will really be a very sad thing because no one can ever say to me that the digital and remote instruction is nearly the quality of our in-person instruction. And even where we're at now in COVID, I taught elementary. It's really a hard land to be in when you have kids that you have to keep six feet or three feet away from you. You can't be at the table working through different things and helping them read by having them right next to you pointing at words. That's a difficult land we're living in right now. So I think we're prepared, but it's not going to be the same way it was if we have to make that shift. You've already hit on this a little bit, but what are some of your inspirations becoming into education? I taught karate with my dad from the time I was a kid, and I would say he is probably the best teacher I've ever seen. He was not formally trained as a teacher, but he understands things like proximity control and how to use physical education to really motivate a team of people in front of him. And he taught me so much just from doing that, that when I entered my education courses, it was a natural fit. I also have a grandmother that was a teacher at Kawanda and my mom was an educator. I never learned directly from her but I got to see my mom in the education world for years. So she inspired me definitely to go into leadership. I would say was her influence more than the teaching piece. That was my dad. 
You know, it's interesting, the karate connection that you just um, mentioned, because my daughter also was in karate, and it really, do you recommend it as, a, as an overall developmental tool for, for kids? Absolutely. I think it and, gave and, me... And adults, I guess, as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think it gave me a level of confidence. I also will say when I've tackled other sports, the precision that you need to be able to move different parts of your body for karate transfers really well when you're doing other sports. I find that I tend to have a little bit of a understanding no matter which sport I'm introduced to and a, and a physical awareness that keeps me a little bit safer and a little more agile in different sports that I know I got from karate. Yeah, and I was also thinking of kind of the structure of karate and the fact that you have belts and you have criteria to, to get mm -hmm. to those belts, which I think is a good educational structure as well to match. So, yeah, teaches you to work hard. <laughs> where do you see educational technology going and where would you like it to go? So, I would love for Aside from the classroom, because I, I'm guessing most of your answers from different people you do this with are focused on the classroom technology. Mm -hmm. And I see a wide range of what we can do in the classroom. One of the things that I was focused on, you know, 10 years ago as a teacher, and I would love to be able to see this happen happening more, is not utilizing technology to deliver content. I really feel that technology needs to go to the place of connection building those personal and social connections, trying to use, for instance, when I was teaching, I did a, um, I had students writing an essay and they were seated in groups and I wanted my classroom fairly quiet. I was circulating like a crazy person around the room to try to help kids. And I introduced my fifth graders to a back channel and I had them jumping on and asking different things like, what do you think of this intro sentence? And every now and then I would jump in but we did it in the evenings as well. And kids could jump in and help one another that way. And I was monitoring it, but it gave them an added connection to one another in the classroom and a resource. I don't really love the stand and deliver approach to anything. And I don't like that with technology either. I think you need that personal connection. So I really see it going that way in the classroom. But the part I'm the most passionate about is our professional development model for staff has been the same for however many years. So when I was in my prior role at Sherman, I actually brought um, Kite into the district as something that would be a little different so that teachers could sit home at night, take a course if they wanted to and whatever they wanted to take a course in. And I found that to be really interesting and that was where I was at there. And I still think that's a pretty quality use of, edu of technology and ed tech. But where I'd like to see it go further is I think the stand and deliver model of PD, professional development, could be very effective in some ways. But I also think people have the capacity to only listen to someone for so long and retain information, where if you're getting some of your development by hopping on Twitter and seeing great tools that other educators are mm -hmm. using, or you're reading a book and connecting with your peers and talking about it, I feel like that's going to remain with people a lot longer. So I'm looking forward to seeing where we go in the professional development realm with tech because I don't feel that's been adequately explored yet. Well, and I think with remote learning, I think, you know, the Zoom fatigue issue was very real. Yes. <laughs> and, and the further down the, you know, the developmental <laughs> chain, it, it's even more difficult, you know. Um, so, yeah. I think in technology has that potential to be more creative, to be more engaging, more innovative, harnessed and used well. I agree. I think our staff did a phenomenal job of utilizing the tools they have, but we have to adapt our teaching strategies too. And I'm everything had to shift so quickly that we really need to continue to do work on how to really engage and connect with kids over a tech forum. All right. Well, uh, you've made it through the first round of questioning. Now it's time for the speed geek question. So let's start off with uh, a fun one, a whimsical one. What is your whimsy? What kind of uh, Harry Potter? Uh... Yeah, love Harry Potter. That's definitely <laughs> my favorite. And I used to watch Star, Star Wars movies with my dad. I would say right now I'm the most into my partner and I have been watching the Marvel series oh, okay. in order. So I've been very into that and I'm starting to get different references 
that I've never gotten before, like whatever the cube is in that movie. I don't <laughs> yes, remember what it's called, yes, but that's my whimsy right now. Nice. That's a good one. Uh, what's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Exercise. 100% exercise. I like to go for walks, ride my bike, uh, ride my Peloton, and I try to never be on the phone when I'm doing any of those things. And um, your favorite educational blog? My mom's, of course. <laughs> she always gets mad because I don't read it enough, but it's definitely my favorite. I do a, a blogging workshop a lot of times. Your mom's is a, one of the exemplars that I bring up. So, And just for the Coffee with the Geek uh, audience, uh, your mom was the second person I interviewed with Coffee with the Geek. <laughs> and f funny story is uh, we actually, I interviewed her in a coffee shop. And uh, it was weird because every time I'd interview somebody in a coffee shop, the coffee shop would close <laughs> like the week later. But so that was one of our few... Uh, forays into the, the coffee shop mentality. So uh, we stopped doing that, unfortunately. You know, there's just not enough coffee shops to, to burn down. <laughs> I was honored to be asked to do this, actually, because I remember you doing it with my mom. Yeah. Yeah, she was super excited to get to be interviewed. Well, and she's a, a visionary leader, and you're following in those footsteps. So uh, really happy to, to honor and to interview both of you. Thank so, you very much. All right. Thank you.